igual son cosas como nosotros no, no tenemos como la, en sí como, como mucho acerca de la técnica sino más bien como del contexto creo que es un poco más bueno, sí porque hemos tenido también muy técnico muy teórico y a veces solo unos cuantos hay otros que son muy expertos como el proceso ¿no? sí. Are you ready? Come on in, everyone. Excuse me, if you were a member, it would help us if you had your ticket read to us. Anyone that's in line, feel free to stay in line, and we're just going to go ahead and open this up for the um, artist talk. So. Welcome everyone, I'm Karen Gilbert and I'm the ICA San Diego board chair. It's great to see you all here and to celebrate the work of the um, Cognate Collective. At the Institute of Contemporary Art San Diego, we present exper experimental art and learning with a mission to question everything. The Institute of Contemporary Art San Diego acknowledges that we are on the unseated ancestral homeland of the Kumaye peoples, we wish to pay our respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the nation who have cared for the land on which we are on. We are committed to standing in solidarity by respecting this land and the Kumaye people, including all tribal nations. I'd like to thank the rest of the board of directors who are here tonight and to our amazing ICA team for making all of this possible tonight. A very special thanks to our curatorial team, Husha Sanders, who curated this show with Amy and Miss Ayel, and to Roxana Lopez. And a huge thank you to Rancho La Puerta for making this exhibition and event tonight possible. Our organization is made possible by ongoing support from the cities of Encinitas, and San Diego, the County of San Diego, the California Arts Council, and the National Endowment of the Arts, as well as support from the Linda Brandis Foundation, Butenbach Foundation, and the Somme Family Foundation. I wanna thank our founding ICA members who make all of our exhibitions and educational programs possible, reaching more than 50,000 individuals across the county each year. If you're interested in becoming a member of the ICA and supporting our institution, co connect with Julia Barch or one of our staff and they'll get you set up. We also would like to thank our drink sponsors tonight, Humboldt Distillery. They're always welcome. Since 2010, Cognate Collective, made up of Amy Sanchez Artiega, Artiega <laughs> and with her partner, Miss Ayel Diaz, develops research projects, public in interventions, and experimental pedagogical programs in collaboration with communities across the U.S.-Mexico border region. Their projects often address issues of citizenship, migration, informal economics, and popular culture, presenting the border region as one that expands and contracts with the movement of people and objects. In Tian Kitzle. Tian Kitzle, thank you. Portraits of, of the market as portal. The duo bridges contemporary marketplaces along the border with pre Columbian markets in Mexico, presenting them as gathering spaces where participants engage in the crossroads between the celestial and territorial worlds. Cognate Collective is a trans border group living in Tijuana, San Diego and Santa Ana. They've presented work at Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, known as LACE, the, Bi the Mexicali Biennial in Pasadena, Hyde Park Art Gallery in Chicago, ASU Art Museum in Arizona, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, at Craft Contemporary and Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles, as well as in Ecuador and Germany. We are very pleased to present their most recent body of work here at ICA San Diego. Thank you.
Hello, hello, hello. Hi. hello. Oh. Can everybody hear me? Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much to the ICA for that um, warm welcome. And thank you so much to all of our family and friends and students um, and wonderful members of our community who are joining us this evening, many of you for making long drives um, to, to be with us here tonight. Um, so, um, so thank you so much. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, the, the body of work that sort of, or the the processes and the, the production, really, that leads to the body of work um, that's on display in the gallery here. So um, this is just sort of a, a thread in our production. Um, there are, I think, other um, projects and other sort of lines of inquiry that in our work together we've taken up. Um, but today we've chosen to just give a kind of focus, um, sort of contextualization of, of the work that's on view in the gallery. Yeah, so we're going to be speaking uh, specifically about projects that we undertook uh, this last summer uh, at the National City Swap Meet that really formed the foundation uh, for the exhibition that you've all uh, had a chance to uh, peruse through. Um, and I think, as Amy was mentioning, this interest in working within marketplaces has uh, been an ongoing through line in our practice, um, which kind of coincides with also just our upbringing uh, and interest uh, in the US-Mexico border region and the dynamics that define the border. Uh, so we wanted to kind of present a little bit of uh, background to how it is that we began to work in marketplaces and how the types of gestures that we've undertaken uh, previously really uh, kind of allow us to undertake the research and explorations that you see in the show um, today. So we wanted to, to just kind of begin by going back to the origins of where we began to work together, and that's at the San Isidro Port of Entry, uh, the crossing where folks line up to cross from Tijuana, Mexico, into San Diego in the United States. Um, and specifically at the San Isidro Port of Entry, um, one of the sites that we started to really gravitate towards um, was this marketplace, uh, was this series of stalls that are flanked by traffic on either side uh, and are selling uh, these kind of, uh, you know, curios, uh, souvenirs uh, to folks that are traveling from Tijuana back into the U.S. Uh, these objects that at once uh, were meant to perhaps convey something about Mexico, about Tijuana, uh, but today uh, find themselves in, in these interesting, uh, you know, um, paradox of being tourist objects that are being sold to folks that are largely from the region um, with drops in tourism uh, during the time that we started working in this market much of the market itself was vacant uh, because there wasn't tourists um, and so these objects became uh, these kinds of strange uh, representations of a past of a kind of fantasy past of uh, Mexico of Tijuana and we became really interested in kind of tracing the origins of some of those objects and the ways that they move uh, across the US Mexico border and how they begin to reveal uh, different um, kind of economic components uh, of cross-border networks, uh, but also social and cultural components. And that research into some of those objects then just led us to developing these close ties to a lot of the shop owners who were initially just very curious as to what we were doing. Uh, and we would explain that we were artists, uh, but then they'd be like, oh, you want to paint a mural? And we're like, no, we don't paint murals. Um, so this is kind of what we ended up doing. And they were still kind of like, okay, that's kind of odd. But um, yeah, like, I mean, if, if you're willing to work with us to try to reactivate this market, uh, we're willing to kind of work with you and lend you some space uh, in the markets to undertake some uh, projects uh, with the idea that perhaps through art and culture we can reactivate this space, not just to fulfill this kind of economic function, but also this important social and cultural function that we started to realize markets uh, fulfill. Yeah, and so one of uh, the ways that we decided to do that as people who had spent a lot of time waiting in line to cross at the border, as I know, like, I can know a bunch of you in the audience have also had this experience, um, is like through radio, right? Um, spending time listening to things, um, listening to music, listening um, maybe to sort of news radio. And so we embarked on this other sort of line that is kind of present in the exhibition, um, but I, we're not doing like a, a broadcast, for instance, in this show, but um, on this 
this hyper-local radio station that we were broadcasting from within this market um, where we were sharing stories uh, about the crossing, recorded in the crossing, produced there, and then broadcasting them within that space. Um, and other activations of that space um, also included this invitation um, and this kind of residency program that we did with um, women from the marketplace um, who were part of a collective called Mujeres Mistecas. Um, and at the time, just because of, so because of the redevelopment of the port of entry when we arrived there, um, but also because of kind of larger structural um, issues of, of racism and sexism um, that th this collective had encountered, they hadn't been able to sell their products um, with permitting. And so the products would be taken away. And there was also situations where then, you know, like um, their children were separated, like horrible traumatic things that happened. So we thought about like how how do you make an intervention um, in in that? How how do we how do we um, collaborate and sort of invite this collective of women who were embroidering and also sewing school uniforms and um, doing this kind of work with um, textiles that was really interesting. So we would invite them to come and finish um, off their products in the space of the market, which then um, made those products sanctioned, right? Because anything that was produced within the market was automatically um, permitted to be sold at the crossing. And then we also hosted a series of language exchanges. Um, and so in those language exchanges, we would gather um, and we would uh, teach to this kind of informal exchange of English, Spanish, and um, Mixteco of Mixtec. Um, and so this is Doña Berta and Doña Francisca, two of our collaborators um, from Mujeres Mistecas, who worked with us to then produce um, this, sorry, I keep swapping, um, to produce this large scale sort of embroidered mural um, that, so the top is in Mixtec and then the bottom text is in Spanish. We found that this was a kind of common proverb um, that says, es mejor encender una luz que maldecir la oscuridad, which translates to something like, it's better to light a fire um, than to curse the darkness. Um, and this kind of mobile um, a billboard sized embroidery was then this kind of performative object that we pushed um, throughout the, the market and around the port of entry. Um, and I think led to um, this <laughs> other line of experimentation in thinking about the billboards um, and the presence of um, billboards and like the parts of the market that were visible um, while the, the sort of interior space um, had been um, you know, sort of vacant. And so um, we, as part of a series of interventions in um, 2016, in the summer of 2016, um, rented a couple of billboards on top of um, the, the market during a series of interventions um, and in collaboration with the artist Tanya Giniga. And we had the series of film screenings that happened atop the market. And so people could tune in um, on a radio frequency to listen to the films, we tried to time them so that um, many of them were on the shorter side. So we sort of um, calculated that people would arrive at the market and be there um, for between like 30 and 40 minutes. And so the films were running um, around like 15 to 20. So you would get to see an entire film and listen to it as you pass the market. Um, and I think that opened a, a really like interesting this other line of questioning, I think that we have continued to make in our work around like the the multiplicity of use that exists um, in in the space of the market. Um, and we think about this sort of notion of the agora, right? This kind of ancient notion of the agora, um, which was a kind of public um, space that hosted the marketplace um, in you know, Grecian city-states. But it also, and this is the Athenian agora that you see here, it also was a site for a political debate. Um, and it was also a site for um, conviviality and for sort of gathering. And I think in the way that we see, the way that markets, um, as we've experienced them, right, have, have kind of played out in our experience, um, we, we started thinking about 
the importance of um, the, the mobility of, of the marketplace in Southern California um, and the way that as people migrate and live sort of binational lives, um, there's also this ability to move between and, um, oh, and maybe before we change slides, I just wanted to say that the other image is the, um, the footprint, is the blueprint of the Mercado de Artesanías de la Línea, which is the market um, where we worked in Tijuana. So, so really thinking about um, like, and, and then, um, so later we moved um, to Orange County because I went to graduate school um, at, at UC Irvine. And so, you know, we made this move. And so we started visiting the Santa Fe Spring Swap Meet, which is a market actually that Misael had visited a lot um, as a little boy with his family. Um, and when we visited the market, um, we saw that there were these phone numbers and these indications to leave messages. Um, so like the, the um, 664 area code, um, uh, like the 1152664, that's like a Tijuana area code. So also uh, these like clues for the kind of um, binationality and transnationality of the identities of the people working within this market space were something that we became really intrigued by. And I think also just generally, we grew up just seeing these cars packed full of stuff driving along the freeways. Um, just which in and of themselves are these beautiful kind of sculptural objects and, and mobile installations of folks that are taking things from markets um, and from yard sales um, and just from picking them off the street even uh, from here in San Diego even up to LA and driving them across uh, to resell in Tijuana. Uh, and so the ways in which these uh, the movement of these objects spoke to these binational ties that exist in our region uh, became really interesting for us to consider in line of this uh, history of marketplaces uh, being tied to different notions of collectivity, uh, the agora and the kind of, you know, Athenian city-state is this kind of cradle of democracy, right? When we think about where democracy has its origins as a political system, it's in these city-states. So the fact that in the kind of cradle of democracy you have political debate and political exchange taking place within the marketplace became uh, really interesting for us to consider in terms of what it would mean to imagine alternative forms of citizenship being facilitated through contemporary marketplace. Uh, that is, how can we imagine what it means to belong to a place, what it means to belong to a region, what it means to cohabitate a region, to belong to community. Um, how can we imagine those things and have debate about those things and dialogue about those things within the space of the marketplace? And that really set the foundation for uh, imagining what it would mean to actually take residence within other markets. Um, and we uh, were able to apply for a grant uh, to purchase a small fiberglass trailer uh, that would ultimately become the Mobile Institute for Citizen Citizenship and Art, or MICA, uh, which you can actually visit uh, outside of the gallery in front of ICA, um, and the first site that we wanted to really explore was the Santa Fe Spring Swap Meet uh, because of these kind of historical ties and personal resonance uh, that, that existed for me uh, in, in this market, and also just because, as Amy was saying, we were living in Santana at that time, so it afforded us an interesting kind of uh, middle point between LA uh, and San Diego, Tijuana, to think about this larger region um, and what it means to inhabit this larger region as uh, citizens that at times have ties that go beyond a single nation. Um, and so um, we set up this small fiberglass trailer within the market, we rented out a space, um, and then used it to facilitate different sorts of workshops and activations. Uh, we worked with a collective of artisan women from Santana who were trying to develop alternative economic systems and models uh, using recycled goods. Um, they taught us how to create these kind of paper uh, crafts using a recycled paper. We also worked with students to continue this process of undertaking research within the marketplace to think about uh, the origin and provenance of objects, uh, both the symbolic uh, origin, right, but also the physical origin and, and what that says about our popular culture and how we kind of develop these sense of affinities with one another. Um, 
and worked with artists like uh, Melinda and Tay from uh, Magpie Collective, um, who have this inflatable classroom to host um, students uh, and develop workshops within the space of the markets. And then we also became interested in, in really trying to activate um, the market as a space for dialogue and conversation around issues pertaining to citizenship, which seems like very broad and kind of like this alien, like this foreign concept almost, uh, because it's so clear to understand, but also so hard to kind of pin down exactly what it means. Uh, so we became interested in, in just w what simple gestures and, and activities could we undertake to begin having a conversation about identity uh, and about the kind of politics uh, of identity when, when they're, you know, formed or they're forming the basis of how we understand citizenship and who gets to move across borders, for example. So one of the initial uh, interventions that we did uh, was a series of um, I, I think drawings, we were calling yeah. them collective drawings. We have a version that you can participate in tonight, mm -hmm. just over here, mm -hmm. um, where we, so in this gesture, we invited visitors to the stall. We gave them, we had these three different images, um, and the images are of the continental Americas. So we have like North and South America, we have a representation of the United States, and then one of the Mexican football club, America, um, right? So these three different um, kind of scales of thinking about collectivity, of thinking about how uh, people, like some people really identify um, with a football team, you know, in, in a deeper <laughs> and more, I think, um, like passionate way, I would say, like from their response to like throwing the poppers um, than to either of these continental identifications, right? So thinking about like the, the kind of way that we frame citizenship as uh, this thing that's tied to passport, I think, um, and complicating that and thinking about the other ways that we, through our participation and the kind of social ties um, that we have in our everyday, um, the way that we actually create those definitions um, through through belonging to each other um, and creating right like these categories for how we belong to each other in ways that I think are um, quite in, important. Um, and then also alongside that, um, we invited uh, community groups. So um, uh, the Spurgeon Intermediate Social Justice Club, for instance, joined us. Um, and we created these balloons where students respond to the prompt, um, the, to the kind of protest chant, what do we want? Um, and upon these balloons, created these kind of poetic demands. Um, so this says, you know, justicia para todos, or justice for everyone. Um, and and in, in fleshing that out, I think in um, creating space for whether it's, you know, thinking about these categories around identification, around the, you know, concept of America or where America is or how America is or, you know, within these balloons, I think trying to have um, these dialogues around the... Um, like abstractness of, of language and like pinning that down um, and talking about that in ways that are really concrete but also intergenerational um, was really important to the gestures that we undertook as part of that work. Um, yeah, and then we became interested in not just kind of leaving those stressors on one side of the border, but literally going then into Tijuana, into markets in Tijuana to undertake the same uh, gestures as well as ones that were a little bit more specific and tied to um, the city and, and to the border as a regional context. Um, and so we worked with artists like uh, Comité Magonista Tierra Libertad uh, to facilitate a version of the protest balloon uh, workshop uh, that also invited uh, people to create their own Tierra Libertad flag, thinking about this history of organizing and binational kind of anarchist, um, utopic, uh, imagining that the Magonista brothers or the Magon brothers did in um, in, the in the early teens. yeah <laughs> in the 19 teens um, and so we developed these types of projects to I think again try to imagine and and more uh, concretely amplify the already kind of existing political dimensions that exist within marketplaces. Um, and we're also interested in undertaking these gestures uh, with students uh, who gravitate sometimes to things that we wouldn't have 
like ever really you know gravitated towards. Uh, so we had a student that we worked with uh, in Tijuana, Sandra Rosales Santiago, who developed this intervention that was a very simple proposition. One of the things that we did was uh, we undertook a, a pirate radio broadcast within the markets. Uh, the Comité Magonista uh, was reading these kind of you know uh, manifestos, like writings, mm -hmm. yeah, and manifestos. And Sandra and I. Um, took up this gesture of sort of mapping the radius of um, of the radio right through this gesture of her dancing through um, the market. And I wanted to say that um, this project was also uh, one that we did with Cristian Zuniga Mendez, who is a Tijuana-based um, educator, artist, and um, just also really brilliant collaborator. Um, and so we had all this work that we did around um, marketplaces and that was kind of synthesized um, and put into dialogue. Those different sites were put into dialogue as part of an exhibition um, that we undertook in 2018 um, where we were thinking about how like those marketplaces like come into um, contact with each other, right? And like in, in the space of the exhibition, um, but also the way that they articulate region for us and allow us to speak about the border as a region, the kind of long shadow um, that the border may cast in our region, the ways that um, like as people who have grown up as like trans-border kids um, who like I, I grew up in the Imperial Valley um, and went to school in Los Angeles and now live in um, San Diego, the way that Misael like grew up in like these kind of um, biographical ways that we've lived our identities um, in this region can um, are reflected in some of the objects too that we see um, in in the marketplace. Um, and so th this is part of that installation and how that looked um, at Grand Central Art Center. And yeah, yeah and you I think that that, that. I, we we really became interested in the ways in which gallery the space of the gallery could afford us uh, an interesting opportunity to put different market contexts into dialogue with one another um, and allow us to kind of zoom out, so to speak. We, we really like to uh, work both very site specifically, meaning like, you know, in one location, like we worked at that market in the crossing. I mean, we're still working there kind of, but we worked there for, like concertedly for like six years straight mm -hmm. and it's literally like, you know, like a block. Um, you know, long. So we work in these very intense ways in, in sites, um, but because we're working in so many different sites at that sort of depth, um, we then became interested in how exhibitions within the gallery space could allow us a, an opportunity for us to reflect on that work uh, and to invite others into that process of reflection about marketplaces and the roles that they play in our region. Um, so we produced a publication, uh, Regionalia, which functioned uh, on the one hand as a catalog of that exhibition of the same title at Grand Central Art Center, but also invited other collaborators like Christian Zuniga, like Karen Stalker, a professor of uh, anthropology at Cal State Fullerton, uh, to think about uh, the role and importance that markets play um, just in, in communities. And I think in particular, I think for us, uh, we really like to think about the ways that markets fulfill a very vital function within immigrant communities because they allow those communities to essentially rebuild home um, when they are you know, far away from the land, from their like homeland. Um, and so I think we became really interested in how it is that through the objects that are sold, uh, through the different uh, services that are provided within marketplaces, they provide um, this connection to home. Um, home both in terms of a local experience of that, right? Uh, at the scale of the neighborhood, at the scale of the city, but also home in terms of other homes that we might have, um, you know, that are more distant uh, from us. Um, and so we became really interested in, I think, continuing to undertake that process of dialogue across different market settings. Um, and we're just always wanting to find an excuse to collaborate with one particular um, kind of vendor and artist within uh, one of these shops, the Sobre Ruedas Pancho Villa uh, in Tijuana. Nestor uh, Zarate is a, a kind of just young artist that sets up this this little drawing stall inside of his family's uh, stall at the Sobre Ruedas, at, at, at the street market in Tijuana. Um, the parents uh, sell all kinds of kind of secondhand goods uh, that come from the border uh, or come from this side of the border uh, and they take them into Tijuana, they resell them. Um, and then just 
kind of in one of the corners, uh, Nestor sets up a small uh, little stool uh, with an easel where he shows two different kind of um, levels of detail for the drawings that he could produce uh, for you on the spot, uh, essentially. So if you go show him a picture of something that you want, um, he'll start drawing it, you peruse the market, and when you get back to his stall, he'll have the drawing ready for you. Um, and so I think for us it became really interesting to think about ways of activating uh, the, this sort of um, kind of form of art making and, and um, documentation that existed already within the market to document uh, these types of processes that were taking place. Um, so we undertook a collaboration with him where we asked him to um, create drawings of different stalls, uh, beginning with uh, his family stall. So we would create these photographs, and then he would produce drawings based on the photographs. Um, and so. And this piece is in the exhibition, and it's framed. Uh, so the frame that it's in actually came from the Sobre Ruedas Pancho Villa, where the Sarate family mm -hmm. sets up. So that's really special. Um, and then we found these other um, stalls that we just thought were, well, on the one hand, were sort of like archetypal, right? Or like representative of, um, so when we talk about the archetype, we're talking about, you know, this thing that can stand in for these larger categories. Um, uh, and so I think they were like these types, these important types that we saw um, in the marketplace. And so this is like, you know, this kind of technology speaker stand, um, you know, with these various like flags that are also speaking to this kind of context of uh, binational identity. This is a really special stand to us. Um, this was a stand of a vendor um, whose name was Felipe, and he sold um, music at the National City Swap Meet. Um, and he innovated this really beautiful armature for um, mounting CDs. Um, and a lot of the CDs that he sold were original music, um, from like San Diego Tijuana, so you know bands um, from the like 60s, like 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, that you know we had like that, like my grandparents and Misael's like dad and aunts would listen to, um, and and so also just like getting to chat with him. Um, and I want to also mention that he's somebody who passed away. Um, the beginning of this year or last, so you know, thank you, Senor Felipe, wherever you are, um, uh, for for like the just also like the ingenuity and these kinds of structures of cultural production um, that kind of come to be in public marketplaces around display um, and around the kind of sculptural propositions. So this is a fruit stand, which is another really um, common sort of type. Yeah, and so those drawings that were produced by Nestor based on the photographs that we created are then placed into dialogue also with uh, other photographs that we produce within the market um, and also these short uh, segments of text uh, that I think are these... Um, <laughs> like these ambiguous, tangentially related um, elements of popular culture mostly uh, that I think for us became an interesting way of trying to facilitate uh, and, and tease out certain relationships between the drawings and the stalls that the drawings uh, you know, represented, um, and then some of the other objects that we were documenting in the photographs. So this project, um, which we call Market Dialogues, is one that is in the show, uh, and we invite you to take a look at the text and, and try to, yeah, like, draw up your own connections in terms of, of the images that are included in each of these. Yeah. And so while we were doing that, so while I, I also think it's important to say that the Sobre Ruedas and uh, sort of public marketplaces were the one of the first places that we started going, um, you know, post um, like quarantine um, because it felt, you know, safe ish to be out in, in public shopping. Um, and so we so we were visiting these spaces, um, but at the same time, uh, because we weren't able during um, this kind of period of, of quarantine to be like out in public space and make work in the way that we had previously, um, we also became really interested in thinking about the kind of conceptual and historical um, um, like uh, etymology, right, and the kind of origin of the word tianguis, which is the Mexican um, word, like the word we use in Mexico for um, these kinds of public marketplaces. Um, and 
we found that its origin um, is in the word tiankitsi, um, which is the uh, Ple we also known as the Pleiades constellation. So, um, do you, well, I can let you talk about the glyph. Yeah, no, the, I was just pointing it out. So yeah. this is the actual uh, glyph that was produced in one of the earliest um, documents that we have of uh, pre-Columbian, uh, pre-colonial culture uh, and knowledge. Uh, so uh, Sagun uh, worked with um, indigenous um, scribes uh, to create these drawings that represented um, pre-Columbian, Mexica, Aztec um, understandings of the world um, and, and included in this series of drawings of important constellations uh, for the Aztec was Tianquistli uh, constellation uh, that has kind of the equivalent in the Pleiades constellation that you see here on the right-hand side. Um, and for us, it became really interesting and beautiful to think about this link that linguistically existed uh, for uh, within Nahuatl, uh, the language of the Aztec people, between this constellation in the sky and marketplaces here uh, on Earth. Um, in part, uh, this link was created and established because the stars are seen to be kind of very closely bundled together. Uh, so it's this representation, right, of, of stars coming together and this notion of why you would come together um, it is really, to I think, exchange. for us, beautiful <laughs> yeah. because it's like you come together in order to exchange and to be together um, as you do in a marketplace. So I think that equivalence between the constellation and markets here on, on Earth uh, led us to really imagine how it is that markets fulfill this kind of interesting um, role uh, at, at the intersection, at the crossroads between so many different types of um, important elements of our life, right? Between the celestial and the terrestrial, between the spiritual and the material, uh, between the ancestral and the contemporary and, and, and the future and, and what's in the future. I think uh, all of this really began uh, to detonate a lot of um, yeah, just excitement in, in returning to the space of the market through this kind of lens uh, of these ancestral connections um, and really tracing the kind of origins uh, of the marketplaces that we see, not just to the Athenian Agora, which I think for us was a kind of conceptual connection, but really think back to where it is that marketplaces like the Sobre Ruedas Pancho Villa have their origin and they have their origin in these kind of pre-Columbian markets that existed. Yeah, and so we um, ended up thinking about um, these connections and writing this speculative um, piece um, that you also see in the gallery that it narrates this sort of story. While we were working with a community of um, artisans and um, uh, craftspeople in Santa Monica when we were doing a residency there at 18th Street Art Center. And it also happened that um, the people we were working with, there was seven women who were working on the project and another um, term for the Pleiades constellation is the Seven Sisters. So um, I think because of, of those connections around the kind of like temporality of the production um, and the fact that all of those seven women we were working with were also immigrant women. Um, so again, like thinking about um, the, the way and maybe do, should we go to the next one? So in like one of the posters that we have for the um, project that we developed in the National City Swap Meet, we have, you know, these little feet which in the codices represent uh, migration, right? So thinking about the way that this form um, uh, migrates um, and like the Sorre Ruedas, the Tianguis um, move with people because people are are what make um, these these spaces and and um, you know it's our it's our gathering um, it's our being together in this way that um, really like authors the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So then. Um, we, or did you want to say more about no, that? No, no, no. <laughs> so we decided that we should like really follow this line of research. Um, and so we uh, went to the, well, one of the places that we went um, to, to really kind of think through um, the, this research and these ancestral connections. Also thinking about like the kind of legacies of sustainability and the way that um, these uh, pre-Columbian markets exist in this present day, right? Like they, um, 
they've moved slightly, but they um, continue to set up in Mexico City, like on Sundays, you can go, um, was in going to the um, National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City um, and looking to some of these um, collections. So this is the maquette of the, um, the Grand Mercado de uh, Tlatelolco, which is one of, uh, which was one of like the most enormous and sort of, um, yeah, like wonderful um, markets. And there's a nice, um, we, if anybody would like to know more about the connection be between this market um, and some of the work, there's a video also in the trailer that you can watch. So maybe I won't say that much more about it, but do you want to talk about the relationship of the site? Yeah, so we just wanted to kind of orient folks uh, Telatelolco was its own kind of city uh, on uh, the island of Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire, present day Mexico City. Um, so it was a kind of neighboring city to, to the capital um, that hosted this humongous market. Um, tens of thousands of people every day would show up uh, to gather uh, and exchange. And interestingly, um, through the research, uh, we realized that um, and you know learned that the objects that were being purchased and sold uh, in this market were not just local, but were also uh, objects that were being brought from throughout the region uh, through these uh, networks of trade that extended into the U.S. Southwest, uh, the system of uh, pocheteca uh, merchants uh, that would travel on foot uh, to other cultural contexts uh, to exchange and barter with other indigenous groups and bring things like turquoise uh, from the Southwest uh, down into the Central Valley of Mexico. Um, and so the way I think for us that even in these ancestral markets, we see um, how these regional bonds are being sustained through the practice of exchanging goods, um, goods that once again uh, fulfill these very basic needs, right, like food and clothes that we wear on a day-to-day -day basis, but also these objects that are much more precious, that are much more tied to a sense of you know, spiritual understanding and, and practices that I think for us really just was exciting to, to realize that the kinds of threads that we found so exciting and so vital in markets today have existed um, since, um, you know. Since markets have. Since yeah. markets have, essentially. Um, interestingly, um, we then went uh, to Tlatelolco, to the site where this market existed. Uh, presently, uh, with the conquest, uh, you were only able to find ruins uh, because um, the Spanish showed up, um, destroyed many of the temples that were there, um, and actually used some of the bricks from those temples to build up uh, churches like this one that stands in the Plaza Las Tres Culturas, or the kind of square of the three cultures, because you're able to see ruins of those kind of pre-Columbian uh, structures, those Aztec structures, uh, the colonial structures that were built, and then the modern day Mexican structures that, that have been created in, in the same space. Um, and so I think for us, it, it just became, um, it, interesting to to realize that th this site of this marketplace has this r very just rich history uh, and ongoing importance to stories relating to Mexican identity. Yeah, I think it's also important to mention that the Plaza de las Tres Culturas is also the site that in 1968, like students are slaughtered by the Mexican government um, for protesting. So I think also just like in its contemporary history, it's also a site that's really rife um, with yeah, like uh, thinking about um, uh, these kinds of impositions of, I think you could argue, like these forms of uh, colonial violence. Um, and so the archaeological site that um, uh, that you're all seeing images yeah. from it's is right, right there. Here. Yeah. Right here. And uh, so it became interesting because we realized that... Um, when we went there, mm -hmm. <laughs> we just like turned the corner. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's better on the next image, actually. You can see it a little better. Yeah. That all of this like patchwork that you see here of the little yellow and blues and white, that's all the, um, the Tianguis, uh, Lagunilla, which now exists just adjacent um, to where the historical Mercado Tratelolco had been. And seeing this um, like patchwork of um, 
of stalls, what, I think what is so incredibly moving, and it's part of the reason that um, in in the work, um, in this body of work, we're thinking so much about like the tarp and about the shade structure, um, in that it's providing you know uh, this kind of respite, this kind of um, architectural container for the market to take place. But it also becomes um, this important kind of mediator, right, of sky, of of the Tianquitzli, this relationship of sky um, to to the land, um, to the marketplace itself, this kind of um, really poetic mediator. And so this is um, just a, a snippet nice, of that. Yeah. The video is in the room behind us, so maybe we can, do you want to move yeah, yeah. to talking about um, maybe the mirrors? And then I'm just trying to be conscious of time so that yeah, we can have so questions. I think, um, as, as we continue doing this research, uh, as Amy was saying, we, we became interested in, in how it is that visually we can continue to explore this link between the sky and the earth, between the ancestral and the contemporary. Um, and we also came across um, an actual glyph, a kind of monumental glyph that was created in stone of how it is that um, the Aztec um, kind of depicted the market. Um, and that's this glyph here that you see as this kind of um, circular structure that points to the market as a very important center. Um, the ways that there was an understanding that the market serve this important function of gathering um, and really kind of orienting a sense of community. Um, and through further research, we, we discovered that um, this glyph has its origin also in the Tezcatlipili, uh, which is this solar disk um, that folks would wear um, to indicate a kind of uh, role uh, as a political dignitary or um, as a kind of ambassador figure. Um, and so th this are uh, discs uh, that were representations of the sun that then inspired the glyph for the market. Um, and these were also mirrors uh, because of the material that were um, that was used to produce these, and folks would wear these uh, on their body. Um, and so that role between literal depictions of the markets um, and the sun, I think for us also became an, another interesting way of thinking about um, the videos uh, in the show uh, in terms of the tarp itself as mediating this kind of ancestral link between uh, the markets and, and the sun. Um, and this really set the foundation also for the other two uh, gestures. Um, and projects that are in the exhibition, which we undertook again at the National City Swap Meet. One thinking about the constellation and, and our relationship to the constellation, and one thinking about the mirror and how it is that we can think about the mirror um, as, as a sort of portal. Yeah, so um, I want to like take a moment to give a shout out to Renata Orozco, who is here, I think. Renata, are you around? Could you like wave right there? Thank you, Renata. Um, and to Sol, yay! Um, and to Sol Martinez, who were our project assistants um, in the swap meet during this like wild weekend. <laughs> um, also, I think my tío's here, my uncle Roberto Partiaga, who also was like a big help. Thank you, tío, um, <laughs> for for just like um, coming by and helping out. So um, we love this work um, from 1966 by Yoko Ono, where Ono um, sets up a monitor in the gallery um, to watch the sky. Um, and so inspired by Ono, we set up a similar gesture um, where we oriented a camera toward where the Tianquitzli constellation rises in the swap meet and invited people to come into a stand uh, where they um, watch the sky, and they listened to the audio that we have here. So we have a version of that that's installed in the exhibition that everybody can see. Again, like um, sort of after Ono and thinking about this um, that we see. So you can see this inside in the front gallery. Um, and then I think the final thing we just um, want to talk about are the portraits, the, the book of portraits. Um, so we were really captivated um, by the kind of history of the mirror as, so not just as symbolic of um, dignitaries, um, but also this kind of uh, connection to the night sky um, through um, the deity that you see here, Tezcatlipoca, whose uh, name means the smoking mirror, who's the deity of the night sky. You'll notice um, that, or maybe we can, should we 
do you want to go to the to the Huanga? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think the other kind of resonance, so on the one hand, right, this kind of connection to the night sky um, via the mirror, and then because of this work that we had undertaken um, in the kind of context of the market, um, also thinking about kind of representations of mirror, this image from Juan Gabriel, um, which I think has been really significant in thinking about this kind of question of citizenship and identity um, in our work. And portals. And, and portals, right, this kind of question of the portal. So we collected a series of several mirrors. Um, uh, like uh, there was like I think twenty some. We should have kept like better count. But what ended up happening is we bought many many mirrors, and then we set up a stall of mirrors. Um, and so our our project assistants and like friends and different people came by. Um, we sold many of the mirrors with the condition that then people um, allowed us to take their portrait. Um, and so the other aspect that you see of this in the exhibition is this Codex Fold book. Um, that so these are you know three of the portraits portraits that are in the show um, and a codex fold book that um, is inspired by also by pre-Columbian uh, Mexica codices. So I think that's kind of like an overview of our trajectory. Um, where's, I think Claudia was signaling at us before and I don't see her anymore. Um, I think we're happy to sort of um, take questions around any of this. Um, Anything else questions? I'm going. Excuse me. Anything else? Come on, guys. <laughs> you, you. Who say hi? Okay, thank you. Oh yeah. Back there. Yeah. There. Does your project continue? Yes, we, I, it's, it's funny, um, we really started, so all of this is just a giant excuse for allowing us to go to markets like guilt-free and just as much as we can and call it work. Um, but actually, it, I think it's just really fun and something that we do even when we're not working. Um, so I think our intent is to continue uh, the work uh, and the explorations. Um, the connection to Mexico City is something that is uh, relatively new. So I think we're excited to, to continue thinking about that and potentially um, yeah, following um, whatever other locations and, and interesting dimensions um, having to do with markets appear through through the research. Thank you. Anyone else? Ask. Yeah. Oh, I think the mic's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Loved it. Um, interested in whether you you have an interest in continuing this in terms of not just the marketplace, but the importance of um, migrants to agriculture across the border. Yeah, I think um, our work, so there's other parts of our work actually that are very interested in this kind of question both of migration, but also I grew up in the Imperial Valley, like my, um, like my great grandfather was like a UFW organizer. So we actually have a, a strain of production that thinks about some of those questions. Um, and I would direct you to the San Diego Public Library where we have um, work in an exhibition that's in the gallery there where you can like um, get a sense for some of that. So yeah, so thanks for that question. I, uh, yeah, I'll also just add that um, as we spoke about, one of the interests is following the provenance or the origin of some of the objects that are sold within marketplaces. And one of the things that is very commonly sold are, is food. Um, so I think following the kind of or like networks of, ne of food production and then food sale is, is something that, that's been in the background of, of a lot of the work that we do. Um, and I think something that, yeah, uh, in the future we might uh, explore a little bit more directly. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Hello, 
That was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is um, more about what, what have you seen? I, I think you mentioned this a little bit when you talked about the uh, mujeres mistecas that weren't allowed to sell in the market. So I guess what have you seen in terms of uh, power, like thinking about your you know, board there where I can't remember what it says, where does power yeah. reside? And, you know, in these markets, I'm sure there's someone that dictates who gets to sell, who doesn't. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you. And then I said I was going to give a shout out to Rumi. So this is my shout out to Rumi. <laughs> hey, Ruby. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that question, Catherine. That's a really good question. Um, so I think one of the um, one of the kind of adaptations, or one of it's not an adapt. I think one of the uh, facets of markets that we find really intriguing that's set up on the street is the way that people, when they are told they cannot sell within stalls that are maybe sanctioned by a union or by those people who have power to say, like, this is a permit and this is, you know, this is how the documents that you need to sell in this sanctioned way. The way that people then set up um, these kind of tangential markets. So whether it's like in people's garages, so like renting people's garages or kind of like carport spaces um, that are just adjacent to the market, like a few blocks away, right? Um, as, as this kind of circumventing of those those um, rules that then lead to this expansion of the market in ways that are really like rhizomatic and really like web-like as opposed to these you know linear ways that the main that the market grows in ways that are um, sanctioned so I think that um, yeah that just produces this like innovation around then these larger um, like innovations and expansions of that space into the community that are really fun um, like places where people do like haircuts um, or they'll do like people just also renting out or like you can pay like five pesos to go into bathrooms um, that people may have like outside. So these kinds of innovations um, that, yeah, that kind of circumvent that. Which also becomes a really nice metaphor, right, of, of figuring out how to within communities circumvent official limitations, right? Um, and so creative adaptations of, of how to inhabit the market space are also things that we're just always fascinated to learn from. Thank you so much, representation. Enjoy the music, and thank you for coming in. <laughs>